That is behind the stage. Let's see. Yes, I do. Can I help? Can I help? It says you're in. I think you oh. need to click admit there. There we go. There we go. Recording.
The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Yes. We're trying to figure out the audio right now. Yeah, I thought so. so. I problematic. unmuted myself. Great. And he's, and he's using the microphone. Perfect. So is that, is that yeah. how you guys yeah, do yeah. it? Okay, cool. And um, do we disable the waiting room or would you like to go in? I asked here, Sarah, but she's not here yet. So, so if you don't mind, just in the waiting room. Not at all. Um, maybe I'll just sit right you here until she wants to spin it around. Well, because then the video won't show him. So I'll just sit here um, until we're ready to go. But I might ask Sam to. Do you mind if yeah. I drink wine while I interview <laughs> people in the waiting room? I do mind that you enjoy yourself. Good. So I think absolutely. You Wonderful. Um, not yet. Oh, I do. I do need your help. Can you go give my purse to Dada? Thank you, honey. <laughs> It'd just be you.
And do you have a cup of water? Do you want like a bottle of water? Bottle of water. Okay, good. Do you need help? Not right now, honey. Okay, tell me if they need okay. Thanks, honey. Big helper. came back from the uh, oh let's get out of the way of the computer here okay unless you want to be front and center on video oh how's that make us oh like it's doing a video yeah, right now it's okay. gonna record his talk yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. 
He's in the back. Could you grab me a bottle of water bottle? Mm -hmm. Just my water bottle, so I have it right here. Thank you. 
We just want to find your seats as our more people will be filtering in, I'm sure, because it sounds like it's a great party down there at Vita's tonight. When there's two things happening on Lopez, you know it's a good night. So I just wanted to um, do the requisite ask about uh, once we get into a few more people, I'm going to ask you the two questions that the center always asks which is how many of you are from off island and how many of you are in paid lodging? So you can think about those questions and lie to me if you like. All right, so I think I gave you all enough time to think about it. Was that enough time? <laughs> and because I know, I think almost every single one of you, I probably know the answers, but raise of hands, how many people are from off island or don't live on this island tonight? All right, all six of you. And how many of you are staying in paid lodging? All right, one out of six is not bad, great. Um, so the reason that the center asks these questions is for the LTAC grant, which is a lodging uh, tax. And so we uh, just asked that as part of the grant. So uh, welcome everyone. Most of you know me as well, but my name is Nikita Palmasani and I feel really honored uh, to be here tonight and to be welcoming Pat Espen. Um, I am a Madrona Institute board member and this is a Madrona Institute sponsored uh, climate talk. It's one of many. And I just want to give you a tiny background, which is that um, uh, I met Pedestin in 2007. And uh, when I moved here in 2014, um, Pedestin really is the person who, uh, in 2007, I was doing my graduate work in the Swiss Alps and we were near the glaciers. And I had been there for three summers, almost consecutively. And between 2004 and 2007, I watched at least a thousand feet of uh, glacial melt in my physical body. So the places where I was and the places where I sat on the snow and the places where I returned to were drastically different. Um, and my graduate work was in expressive arts therapy. Pedestin is also an expressive arts therapist uh, and eco-psychologist. And he was the person who really brought it to my attention and my awareness about climate change and the absolute urgency of action. And Pedestin has worked uh, tirelessly on behalf of the planet and on behalf of helping uh, shift the needle uh, towards solutions and toward action. 
So fast forward until 2014, that has been came out with his second book. His first one was Money and Soul. Second book is What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Climate Change, which is the top one, or when we try not to think about global warming. Uh, and um, I got the great privilege to come to San Juan Island. I had just moved to Lopez Island in 2014 and was uh, very much a, a, a self-proclaimed climate warrior and was wildly impressed with the Madrona Institute's climate lecture series. So at that time there were uh, talks almost every week or every other week on San Juan and they were astonishingly good and forward thinking and I thought, this is the place for me. I'm going to be here. And I knew about Pedestman's book. And so I started facilitating a book group on Lopez, which then spread to San Juan, which is how I got recruited for the Madrona Institute board, <laughs> which I still am on. So um, I'll say a little bit more about Madrona Institute uh, just in a moment here. But um, I'd like to just say that it's uh, amazing to now come full circle and to have all of these things meeting tonight. And the first thing I want to do is um, ask Sam Barr, uh, perhaps, to come and give us an opening and a blessing in just a moment and to start us off correctly on this land and in this space. I think in Macquay, I think in RCCM, Hacha, Upsella, CM, Honest Challenger, CM, Sasha, Tito Mark, Sam Bar, Son of Snare, Eat Nif Son of Ningana, Silly, Nif Son of Ningana, Silly here, Chucks Emerson, Eat. Uhilikusan, Unasesta, a tear tang, and he sweats a Mokwe. Ustli, Us, Ustli, Us, it was Kunanga, Susquail. Guaida, Susquail, Ibu, Scarsa, Susquail. Mokwe, says a tear, a Kunanga. The language that I said, and uh, not my first language, as I tried to keep things straight with my toddler, was um, I'll do a little translation. I said that. Uh, Good evening, everyone who's present here today. And uh, good evening, creator. Thank you for this evening. And I said that it, it makes me happy to be here tonight with everyone who's gathered. And it um, makes me happy to help. It makes me ask the question, is it going to be a good tomorrow or is it going to be a bad tomorrow? And um, that we're all here today to help the, the land that is here and the land that is far away as climate is. So just thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. So I'll just say a little bit more about Madrona and about Sam Barr and his incredible work and his partner, Aaron, and of course their wild silly who is amazing. Uh, so just a few things about Madrona. So Madrona Institute is really dedicated to engaging youth could you tell? Could you tell that we're about engaging youth? I mean, Salih couldn't be more engaged in that part. Um, and uh, we're really with the conservation and the stewardship of our local ecosystem. Um, the Madrona Institute helped to establish the San Juan Islands Youth Conservation Corps, which helps uh, empower youth to uh, really keep track and be stewards and have those pivotal moments in nature on these islands that, that then carry forward. Um, also, Aaron and Sam are working on building an intertribal Coast Salish Youth Conservation Stewardship Core program with a group of Coast Salish advisors representing regional tribes to connect tribal youth with their ancestral homelands and these islands. Sam Barr and Aaron Lakata, um, who are both here this evening, are directing this program. So if you have more questions, they are here tonight. So please speak to them. They are tremendous leaders in our community, and we are so honored to be able to work with them. The Madrona Institute is dedicated to climate science and education and to local climate action. So 
So we've sponsored numerous climate talks, as I talked about in recent years, with uh, Volunteer Islands Climate Resilience Team has provided climate language input to the recent county comp plan update, and they helped to develop the 2007 report moving toward climate resilience in the San Juan Islands, funded by the National Park Service. We became more resilient to the, and we're hoping to become more resilient to the impacts of climate change in the years ahead. They are also, the Madrona Institute, are the sponsors of the special license plate. So a lot of you saw that when you walked in, you saw our banner and you saw the little cards. What that is about, it was conceived by uh, Marcia de Chardonnay, who many of you know, who was the manager of the San Juan Islands National Monument, um, but it was a brilliant brainchild of hers. And we are so lucky. And the revenues from the sale of these plates have allowed us to provide grants to youth-oriented stewardship programs in the islands for the last two years. $22,500 in 2021 and $45,000 in 2022. So you can purchase one of these gorgeous plates that has, you know, literally a madrona tree on it. And all of those proceeds go back into supporting our islands and our future generations. So the uh, San Juan Islands Youth Conservation Corps and the Coast Salish Youth Stewardship Corps receive approximately one half of the grant funding each year. And we expect this funding to grow. And of course, with your help. So approximately 1,500 plates have been sold to date, and our goal is to get up to 3,500 plates sold in the next two years, which would provide, get this, $100,000 to stewardship grants in our local community each year. So we ask you just to consider purchasing one, and now you know where those funds go to, and now you know more about the Madrona Institute, and without further ado, I'd love to introduce Pettis and Stopness, our speaker for tonight. Oh, thank you so much, Nikita, for inviting me. And thanks, everybody, for coming out on a Friday night. Are you um, ready for a ride into the future? Yes. Yes. And the youth uh, you were speaking about. So um, particularly, uh, this issue about the youth has been a major um, pull in my heart. Um, and uh, it's now about six or seven years ago that I got a lot of attention around this book in terms of uh, how we, all that irrational stuff we come up with when confronted with the climate science in order to avoid changing our behavior and our investments and our way of life. So um, the, just after I did this, something erupted, which was very heartening for me. Um, and that challenged me to go forward from that book uh, and this talk will not focus on this work, but on what I've done since, because I've been working hard with coming up with an answer, a challenge that came from the youth people in uh, terms of two more books that are out on the economics response to the climate crisis, more than the climate crisis itself. So what happened just after my talk was that millions of youth got onto the streets and Fridays for Future, inspired by girls such as Greta Thunberg and other teenagers, really, really brought it into the center of the town, literally, by sitting down outside the parliament and marching and millions of people in the face of brutal climate news that, despite 30, 40 years of talking about climate change, trends were going the wrong way. So, um, 2018, 2019, and 2021, there are record climate emissions, but not 2020. And why? Yeah. Not because we wanted to cut emissions, but because we all shut down society and we're still with masks, aren't we, Eric? Yes. yes. <laughs> so that had the effect. Uh, 2022 is still up for grabs, um, maybe not higher than 2019, but in the same league. We're not doing too well. And um, how will this go into the future? Because uh, when you're trying to look into the sentiment of these people um, and what kind of longings or demands they're putting on us, they have gathered behind this um, banner, so to speak, of systems change, not climate change. But if we ask young people and many elders as well, what exactly is systems change? What does the system look like? How does the system work? What drives the system? And even worse, if you ask them, 
if you see systems change, um, how do you know it's for real? Is it in the right direction? Is it in the wrong direction? Is it coming quickly enough? Is it coming too slowly? And you can't really expect 16, 18, 20 year olds, no matter how well informed or intelligent or awake they are, to have good answers to those questions. So that was the task I felt was the next step after pointing out all that strange things we do in terms of distancing and overuse of or a response to doom and dissonance and all those things. How can we actually move the needle in a way that really creates real systems change? Um, and it's important to get a new story or new vitalization into place because um, there's a lot of despair and a lot of um, exhaustion and anxiety out there. So I don't know how maybe um, not so many of you are daily users of TikTok when I look at the color of your hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, excuse me, I'm sorry for my prejudice, but this is just my... <laughs> So, but I have a good friend, a climate psychologist, who, who actually does TikTok climate communications. And uh, with her help, I got access to some networks on TikTok that uh, highlighted how people are responding. So here's one lady saying, world has now three years left to fight climate change, and there's almost no coverage. Uh, and people go weeks or months without talking about it. Uh, another lady says, uh, sorry for the, the, the screen isn't too good here, but I'll read about it. Thinking about scientists protesting and the desperate attempts to draw attention to how detrimental the climate crisis is and what it currently means for our future. But you can see from the color and the, you know, the feeling of those posts. Uh, here's another video. They had a whole SWAT team to arrest scientists um, trying to spread actual information about how we try how we don't try to stop mass pollution, etc. We're screwed. We only have five years to try to change it, or we're done. That's another 17-year-old there. Here's one. The climate crisis finally rearing its head to add to the list of humanity's own horsemen. And uh, this one is me debating whether I should press the not interested button on every single climate change video because it makes my climate anxiety worse. And finally, uh, do you guys think it's even worth trying to live sustainably anymore? Is it too late? So this is um, some of the responses I've been confronted with and some of the responses we try to respond to uh, in a constructive way. And that is why we launched the project of Earth for All. Um, so the simple task there is to have, or well, the simple goal is to see if systems change is possible quickly enough. Uh, it's very complex, of course, because, as I show you, the economic system is what is driving this, and the economic system spans a lot of world regions and a lot of dimensions of nature boundaries, not just climate, but also freshwater, as you're aware, and ocean and nutrient flows. And not least, it's about humans. Are humans willing to collaborate, to coordinate, to create real systems change in a long-term perspective, or are we inevitably a short-term species? So this is uh, issues. Are we able to move beyond GDP economics to a well-being economics? That was also one way of formulating it. Now, part of the urgency that we took to this was that in 1972, um, a book came out called Limits to Growth. And some of you may be aware of it. Who's heard about Limits to Growth there? You're a bunch that's been around for some years, lots of experience. Yeah. Limits to Growth was a book launched by the Club of Rome that started to questioning the whole economic system in terms of uh, the dependency and the addiction to ever more growth, um, particularly in material terms and also in population terms. Came out to something called the Club of Rome, and it's been mentioned by, it was mentioned in discussions by all the five American presidents. Uh, so Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, um, George Bush, Bill Clinton, 
all of them were discussing at some point or another Earth for all, no, sorry, the limits to growth uh, question, trying to tell that there are no limits to growth uh, if you believe in human creativity, etc. Now, 1972 to 2022, that's exactly 50 years. So together with one of the co-authors, Jürgen Randers, a colleague and a friend of mine from Norwegian Business School, we put together a new team. And the previous team was with MIT. This team has now been based around the Potsdam uh, Research Institute in Berlin, along with Norwegian Business School and the Club of Rome Network. So that is why this is the results that I'll be speaking about today um, is from this network, Potsdam, Stockholm, Norwegian Business School, but also input from uh, Massachusetts University and uh, yeah, five to 10 others that has been collaborating. And why do we do this way? Uh, it's a systems dynamics exercise that tries to see how all the bits and pieces of the system fit together. And usually climate is dealt with as one topic. It's not connected to, for instance, inequality. We have other reports on inequality. They come from the World Inequality Database, Piketty, uh, other like OECD analysis that look at how different countries are different in levels of inequality and what inequality does to polarization, for instance. Then you have the whole issue of low income countries, the 4 billion people or most of the world who live on less than $3 a day, approximately. 4 billion people, that's half of humanity. And their issue is not necessarily um, climate or, but they, they're struggling to survive. They don't have enough for dignified life. So there are separate reports on that. United Nations Development Program, the World Bank, etc. Then you have the food system. So there are separate reports on the food system from FAO, from EATS and Lancet and other analysts of the food system. And then you have the whole situation around girls, education, women, women's rights, e gender equity, etc. Now, usually these topics are seen separately, but in our the Earth World project, we have this grand ambition of trying to see them together. So how does empowerment of women go together with the fight against inequality? How does the fight against inequality connect to the energy and the climate issue? How does the energy system connect to the food issue? How does food connect to poverty? And how does poverty connect to the education of women, etc.? You get it? So what we did, and I'll show you this in more or less detail, was to set up a project where we tried to find the most effective arrows where we could influence most parts of the system. For instance, if you deal with climate and energy systems, but do not address inequality and poverty, then it will be ineffective. So how can we find ways of dealing with both? And we also want to convey that this is actually possible because we did find ways to do it. So we made a video. Here you go. skepticism and cynicism against this, because uh, really is a prosperous future for all still possible? And what kind of prosperity are we speaking about? So um, typically the debate has gone stuck pro or again, uh, against growth in uh, a couple of, um, so we say, tre trenches. So, um, 
each time we speak about the growth in terms of well-being or economics, somebody is going to come up with the issue, well, you can't have eternal growth on a limited planet, or it's been better put by a friend of ours. You know, everybody here knows David Attenborough, huh? Sir David Attenborough, yeah. Let me see if we can get him here, Sir David <laughs> Those who believe you can have eternal growth on a limited planet must be either a madman or an economist. <laughs> That's the growth dilemma. And many people may fe really feel it is fully impossible to put all 9 billion people onto a situation where they have dignified lives and well-being at a higher level of material consumption that we already do. However, it really depends. Being a psychologist at the, at, at, from the training and then becoming an economist, I've tried to go back and forth, and I don't just take the numbers, but I also look at the frames behind the numbers. So what do we mean by growth? Do we mean growth in population? Do we mean growth in material standards of living? Do we, we, do we mean growth in well-being? Do we mean growth in spiritual development? Do we mean growth in social conflict? So it really depends on what do we mean with growth. Growth in what? And then we also need to be more specific on the limits of the planet. What exactly are those limits that we live within? And this has been an issue of finding out what are the crucial limits and what are those where we can pull the planet back inside safe operating space. So a new thing that has come, or a new scientific tool that has come into use since the 1970s only the last 10 years, we've had this uh, new scientific concept of planetary boundaries. So can I just check, how many of you have heard about the planetary boundaries framework? Nine planetary boundaries. Okay, so quite a few, so I'll spend a little bit of time on it. You see, in the middle there, there is a, what is called the safe operating space for Earth. And that is a situation that humanity developed in. So we built cities, we built civilizations, we started agriculture, all the time since the previous ice age, uh, the climate system, the ocean, the forest systems, the freshwater systems, the nutrient flows, they were in a safe space, safe operating space. Then economic growth got going, and economic growth was pulling and forcing material growth with it. And the material use of fossil fuel, of fertilizers, fossil fertilizers, the cutting down and logging of forests, and the destruction of habitat for wildlife took four out of those nine planetary boundaries and pushed them into the high yellow and red zone. So currently four or five of these, particularly climate change, wildlife, the biosphere integrity, land systems change, which is made in the forest, and then Nitrogen, or what is called nutrient or biogeochemical flows in the scientific language, are outside the safe boundaries. Now, back in the days, we didn't really know where the limits were, but now we do know. This has been updated several times over the last 10 years, and we know exactly how much the carbon budget is, how much we need of genetic biodiversity, and we have quantified how much of the forest is needed to keep the earth going and how much nutrient flows, nitrogen in particular, can be used. So with that, we have redefined what limits are. And we can quantify what does it take for economic development to push those limits back into the safe operating space, so the green area. This is the task of Earth for All, to create more well-being we can have a growth of well-being, but the material underpinnings need to be inside the planetary boundaries, quantified as that green space there in the center. Now, I will show you the model we made, given that Nikita told me that this audience here is uniquely competent and awake and incredibly intelligent. So I'm sure you'll get all the nuances in this model. But first of all, why do you need a model at all? What's the, what's the use of a model? 
So let me use a metaphor. Um, some of you may have used a microscope at school. Take a leaf or a piece of mud and you can look really fantastically well. Suddenly the invisible becomes visible. Also a telescope. You can have a telescope or a binocular which makes the very far away become more visible. What's invisibly far away become visible. Now a model is like that, but we call it the macroscope. So it is something that helps those large systems that we are inside become visible. Macroscope, that's a metaphor. So what are the systems we are inside? Well, if you want to know what they are and that they're forcing us down the wrong road, you really need to know how to analyze as if with a microscope or a telescope, those invisible systemic structures that keep us locked to the wrong road. And that is the use of a model. But the models we've had, they've been terrible. And this is where David Attenborough is straight on the nail. Uh, economists have been stuck in a set of models that are totally outdated. Even the economists agree to that. Still, they're using it for the Fed, and for the national budgets and everything. They're locked into their thinking. So um, in Nature, one of the leading science journals, you find more and more articles such as this. Climate policy models need to get real about people. Here's how. So they point out that how the different costs and benefits of climate policy hit the poor versus the low income groups is very important for the success of these, but an economic model is blind to it. Second, public opinion. Do you have polarization? That would change the way policies are perceived. And the confidence in political institutions is also key if you want instruments to be stable and not to be backtracked one step forwards and two back, one step, two step forward and one back. Because the less trust in shared coordination, public governance, the less willingness people have in order to uh, support it over time. These things do not exist in economics model. So that's one reason we had to make a new model in order to get it in. And we have, I'll show you how it moves afterwards. And the other is this idea about rational humans and that markets are in equilibrium, that they're stable. Um, for some reason, economists believe markets are stable. I wonder if they've ever looked at the stock exchange. It's more like a whiplash than mm -hmm. equilibrium, right? <laughs> Still, they think that there's an equilibrium in markets. And now they've given up on the single equilibrium and they try to redefine it in terms of multiple equilibrium, maybe without two equilibria. Um, but it's like a little bit like, you know, trying to um, fix the same problem with just a little bit uh, uh, modification on the tool. But there is this willingness in the economics community to look for new types of models now. And this is the opportunity that we want. We want uh, the students to learn new economic thinking, and we want the professors to employ new economic models rather than the old and outdated ones. So in our model, that I'll present the results for in a moment, the Earth Hall model, we have a global system. There are 10 different regions with different production systems. We have nine planetary boundaries which define that the limits for the growth. And then we also include well-being. How's life? And public spending, how much are we willing to put forward to the commons or shared values, or the shared wealth? And then social capital, which is another word for trust. Are there trust between people? Are there trust between the people and the government? Yes or no, is it getting worse or is it getting better? And these things have only existed more or less in surveys, not in models. In our model, it has a real effect. If social trust goes down the drain, then we can predict that the responses to energy and food prices will be slower. And we have used the uh, best type of research in order to find the strength of these links. So this is the new model. We have a natural world, not just an economic world, and we have societal responses. 
to what happens in the global economy and also what happens in the natural world. So if the natural world goes down the drain, then this will have a societal response in our system. Um, um, here you see it. Nice, huh? You get it? <laughs> Uh, well, actually, this is a simplification of the spaghetti. Um, <laughs> our real spaghetti is much, much more uh, evolved. But I'll take you through just a few things to see if uh, I have time. Oh, 8.40. Okay, 6.40. Because the main models look at the GDP and how much investments are put into the financial system and how much tax comes in, how much savings and the net taxes, which is the difference between what uh, comes in and what is saved. So, um, what we add is how quickly are we fixing our investments in regenerative agriculture, in the renewable energy system, and how much, how quickly are these rolled out by becoming cheaper than the mainstream ones. That's what they call the cost of greening. And this will then influence the emissions, and then that will influence how much environmental destruction we get. And then this will affect the well-being of people. And if we feel that this is going the right way, then the trust will goes up. But if we feel it goes the wrong way, then social tension will result. You have more polarization, and well-being goes down. So this is how we connect those usually three different domains. Economics model do not have nature. They do not have social trust, they only have economic assets and those things. So hopefully now you get that idea of where we're really taking this. And I think this is crucial in our answer to the challenge from the young, that we show that we are able to connect the dots to make sure we can explain exactly how the system works. And if we know exactly how the system works, that they can have more faith and more encouragement and more enthusiasm in actually changing the system. So you could say, so what? <laughs> because this doesn't give you much. Um, in order to give back, we made this video, and you, as you may see, suddenly a, a version of myself that I didn't create started to roam around the internet. <laughs> Let's see. The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Not utopian, but functioning and fair. This is the story of Earth for All. We assembled a group of economic thinkers and scientists and developed a computer model to test their big ideas. We then asked, what's possible in one generation? If we carry on as normal, population and material footprints continue to grow, particularly due to overconsumption in rich countries. The gap between the richest and everyone else widens. Social tensions worsen climate change impacts become ever worse. But what if the world takes a giant leap now with five extraordinary turnarounds? In this possible and plausible future, all people can live a good life within safer planetary boundaries. We avoid the worst climate impacts. Poverty ends earlier. Population peaks lower. Well-being rises. Social tensions fall. Nature starts to heal. Incredibly, the investment needed is only 2 to 4% of global income. But we do need massive investments now, driven by governments on a clear mission to enact the turnarounds. Another big idea is a citizen's fund for each country, where companies pay to use our commons, the wealthiest contribute fairly, and the funds are distributed to all citizens equally. But rebooting economies won't happen on its own. We need a global movement, kicked off with worldwide citizens' assemblies. This is Earth for All. How the story ends is up to you. 
joineearthforall.life. The world has type of scenario and why are we not making more progress despite of everything and that is mainly inequality because what we find in the system is that how quickly we can take action in climate you see depends on how much we can deal with inequality and poverty because with more inequality and poverty gradually goes down and people get more supported so you get more isolationism more protectionism, more nationalism, more unwillingness to share the progress. And that takes down the speed of response. 
So this is what happens. Go to 15. Well, I mean, if one thing goes down, people think the society is in the wrong way. Trust goes down. Public, uh, policy action on food and energy and coordination goes down. Uh, it just makes it more difficult to fund well being and then it's more difficult to accelerate change the food system and, and the average uh, temperature goes up, more environmental balance is just a tool for the world. So that is how the system works. But if you go to question, are we ever capable of saying something about well being in the future? What is well being for us? Hmm? Security, maybe part of it. And there are now quite a few governments who try to rewrite their economics and their national budgets to become well being economics. And these are the economies they're out in Sweden, Scotland, Germany, uh, Finland, parts of the Netherlands, etc. And they put together something called the well being alliance. Uh, and they say that it is with the social security, they go to the that they have a fundamental need to affect the security that they need. In addition, we need a nature that works and we need connections, institutions focused on delivering shared well being and fairness, which is a certain fair distribution of the commons and the wealth and participation that citizens can be actively engaged in economic economy and community, that they have a low test sensor they can come to and buy anything. We have big discussions and create a sense of community, right? And these things can get more and more to be measured by variables. Um, whether they're the best variables, I don't know. That there are that there are approximations, that's for sure. And that's how we can calculate the future well being. Well -being. So, this so deep analysis is that inequality erodes social trust, trust that brings down the level of public action and coordination. Meaning that inequality may get worse, so just goes down, speed of public action goes down, and inequality gets worse. In addition, if, if public coordination goes down, this will worsen the speed on which you can phase out fossil energy and create better food systems. And if those systems are not done in the right way, then inequality will not worse. So what does it take then? Now we know why, to put it on the why is USA not the way it has with the last 40 years? Some scholars say there's a good description here, and I could have shown the curves of the trust in American society. Since 1970, it's been very simply going down. So what can we do about it? And that's where I'm going to end. Uh, are we going to do a future scenario of the too little too late or can we do the giant leap that you mentioned in the video by the way this is from norway <laughs> i couldn't resist it this is a wedding picture so the wife the bride was up here and then she jumps to her man over there wow <laughs> take some courage but um it went well Good. Um, so, are we, is, it, is it feasible that we could do a giant leap rather than just a change with so that dynamic approach? And what we need then are these price turnarounds because we call them turnarounds because they don't necessarily produce you the strategy. You have to change the direction of the plan. You've had that direction for 40 years and they now need to shift in that way to this way. And the first is that we can allow low income countries or financially debt and access to leapfrogging technology and access to um, safe local technology for green and health investment to grow their GDP quicker so that they are actually able to convert the economy up to a level where they have 15,000 new jobs per day. The reason why we can make this specific is that we have seen on a number of trends, such as education, clean water, health services, safety, that the minute low income countries pass 14 to 15,000 dollars, they have achieved a lot of well being growth, and then 
if the world is one and beyond that, it doesn't help us now. It's, it's a kind of positive return that is not the same. It helps a lot to go the economy if it's very good, but when it costs 15000 dollars it doesn't help us much and it's very few. What it helps more than that is to address inequality. And our studies show that if we can have the wealthiest 10%, take no more than 40% of national income, that seems to be a positive investment in inequality. Then top 10% tend to take more than 50% of income, and they have way more than 70% of the national wealth. Third, transforming gender equity. It is primarily based on education and access to jobs and economic autonomy of women, which actually is fantastic for the economy forever. And one of those things is based in Norway. A lot of people think Norway is a weak country because of gas and oil, and that's been used by Norway for well since the 1970s, and it's totally right. The main reason for the growth of wealth in Norway is the inclusion of women. Highly educated, motivated women in the economy of the economy. The human capital there is 75% of the economy, but the total capital is 5 Another very important contribution. Fourth, we need to transform the food system. I'm now learning a lot uh, from low press here. I'm hearing about it from Lupita and others every day, which is doing a deep dive into farming, sustainable agriculture, and healthy diet for people. So I can coexist within time to boundaries. And then finally, what we call a carbon law, which is you invest enough in greenhouse creating renewables, you cut greenhouse gases to 60% every decade. So every 10 years, you need to halve your emissions. Fully doable, ha happily, I can show you the numbers. It's actually cheaper than going on with the fossil fuel system. Um, so a lot of detail on this uh, change of uh, strategy or the direction are happening to a certain extent. For instance, in the US now, most meals cover 20% of farmland. Um, energy system efficiency is still moving slowly, but electrification is pretty much finished by the week. Um, some progress has been made on standard policy space for low income countries. Um, some, pro some progress was made in the OECD last year in terms of agreeing on the cotton for corporate taxation, which now is back to 15%. So we got a harmonization there, and this is going better than many people feared. So maybe my ally is also more important than the in terms of changing the system around. So the issue is can we do it? Can we have spreading of new farming techniques? Food system efficiency in the sense of less of food waste, less food loss, changing the diet for uh, plant based protein and uh, new genders for meat rather than grain fed, red meat, etc. Can we give access to the low income countries to new uh, information technologies and new health technologies and renewable energy that's cheaper than being becoming reliant on diesel? Can we also make sure that we start to get a citizens fund in place more and more places, not just Alaska or uh, Swedish Columbia, where there are CO2 tax? So this is the agenda for the rest of the century or the next decades, according to our study. These are the high leverage points. And if we push more and more of them, we will be able to turn the system around towards a giant leap. And with that, um, I'll show you how it looks. So, if we deep into this, uh, uh, this uh, hello, here we go. This jump. If we do this now, with the five colored triangles I showed you, the effect is all the following. So, the population peaks a bit earlier, and then goes a little bit lower in 2100. So, that's not a big difference. We have still have a lot of humans. And the main finding is that these humans who have a much higher well being, so their well being goes up here. Social tensions start to decline from 2020 because of the reduction in inequality and also uh, the, uh, the growth among the, the, the third group. Global warming stays below 2 degrees. We do crash to 1.5 by the way, but um, it's only happening in uh, 2016. 
in which quality started to climb, probably around 20, uh, 40 years, 35 years earlier, to one generation earlier. And this is the reason why well-being has continued to climb throughout the century. The lyrics I will offer you, you have to make up your mind. Imagine that the land where we know where there's maybe 2,000 residents. What world will they be looking back at? Will it be the two days of the lake? My kids will think about their dad. And this will be two fifteen little presents in the world. This is different one. Or we will make it one two. We will actually transform this one in the next 10, 20 years. Which do you believe? Or and everybody has to vote. You have to vote. This thing is not to be a resource, okay? That's the deal. You have to raise one hand, empty, either one of them. So those who think, okay, it's not necessary to have enthusiastic or cynical side, but you seem optimistic and you're not very rational or you're not, not, not very uh, realistic. So you go to two days a Or if you think, well, actually, Parents are concerned now, and this is the point where they accelerate towards a new type of system. So I think we will see a family hand up. Ready? One, two, three. Those who think two days too late, hand up. And those who think it's a giant leap, it's 21 million. Well, I can't handle it. What's the one that I need? Over here, you can get that thing. Stop. Because my, 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 uh, but if you have questions for me, please do so as well. So, anybody who wants to come up, why do we see a giant new plan? Do you work with a giant new plan? Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, first of all, I think what's happening is that there's a round level swell, and we have the ability to communicate in a very far reaching manner. So that just like this presentation, are you familiar with the Earth Boundary Blue Boundary that was set as non travelers? I just watched that on the Netflix. Yeah. Breaking the boundary. Breaking the boundary. Yeah. So, you know, I looked at all that and I sat there and I thought, you know, I mean, what is the energy of the Well, it's accessible to many, many people. Who open up their mind and have the energy in their heart to look at what the city is doing, who are just thinking that this is what's going on and the vision is there for an agenda about how many people. And so when something comes along that leads to a success result, and you know, we have to get people coming in. We don't get some of those uh, boundaries where we were doing well coming back down. This war, as opposed to over over the lake, right? Then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So that information now is like what we put it in a really fantastic way. Because mm -hmm. I always have to meet those people. Those who are thinking to yourself, and my other people, so what minds are 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 getting more spiritual misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So your mind is very clear about yeah. There, there is a moment we now have access to the model. We can see it. It's transparent to us. And it gives us, we can just reset mm -hmm. our mind. So I have to explain to you the, the story of all that. Thank you. You're almost convinced me to the reason why the ground is around us. I can mention one thing that uh, supports this. Because when we came out of the book, uh, Earth for All in Germany, and we actually launched it in Germany, the first journal in, in, in English. We sold 40,000 copies during this month, and we had 180 million unique views on, uh, on, our, on, our, on, on the launch. So you can have 180 million people heard of Virgin World in the first five years. So that's a sample of what we would say. Thanks. Well, thank you for a fascinating presentation and information.
I'll answer your question and then I have to answer you. Ooh, that's it. Great. Um, I think why I am optimistic is because the vision of where we can get to is actually where people want to be. And once they start to get into it, they actually prefer it. It's like LED lights. Once LED lights got past a certain point of cost and quality, even people that were politically opposed to it, ideologically opposed to it, suddenly they're buying LED lights. And I think it's just the good thing we have going for us is the earth we're envisioning with the giant leap. People will prefer it. So if we can just start to get them to understand and experience that, they'll head that way, I believe. That said, I'm, I'm very curious of what you take from the Earth's response to the COVID epidemic. What gives you hope in terms of that response in regards to making a giant leap across all of these issues? And what would you concern? Right. So, um, first, your idea of coming to that how when we get those solutions in place, because that is really so important to have this uh, easy regenerative agriculture, electric cars, yeah, battery solutions. Then they can go that much quicker than people think. We've seen that over and over again. Like when a um, hundred years ago, when the fossil fuel car was invented and mass produced, through the assembly line of motorcycles, it took uh, 60 to 80 years before 80% of all American households died. But when the internet came, it was only 15 years, and when it came to mobile phones, it only took smartphones, it took only six years to go from zero to 80%. So innovation can spread quickly these days. Uh, and that's one of the hopeful uh, elements. Uh, uh, so by the way, and then <laughs> COVID has a thing that more. Spread very quickly, right? <laughs> um, so, COVID made, as you say, the world change behavior dramatically quickly, uh, and uh, in a way that is hopeful. However, basic thinking of my previous research with the psychology of climate, there's a huge difference between COVID and climate because the way it is perceived by the human brain. So, COVID is near, personal, and urgent. If somebody is talking behind you, uh, and they don't have an option. Even if you just want immediately you get a slight uh, fear, slight fight, and a few seconds of thought. But the climate is very different from that. So not all of these boundaries are similar uh, to COVID. They are more similar to climate in the sense that nutrients or the use or the loss of animals is gradual, and you don't really see how this behaves in a human uh, risk perception. Uh, and the cost is right. Uh, when we gathered all the world's bright genetically and medical competences in a network, we developed a vaccination at a speed that was unimaginable just five to ten years ago. So, and then it was spread out in a way in rich countries that were extremely efficient relative to previous ones, but I don't think it's great to kind of vaccinate um, apartheid, where the low income countries were at 9 percent and also left the chance to roll it out. So, COVID is a very interesting case of how we handle disruption, and you can, depending on the story of your narrative, you may pick up um, uh, both hadith uh, and uh, malfunction. So we have a big, big paradox in this, but we can also see how it is brilliant for that. And this is how we have scenarios. I like to use the phrase a metaphor of having two eyes, because uh, you have two eyes, and the other you can see death. Uh, and I'm not sure which one of them I see it when the other, but they have to think in both ways. The call is about a huge success, and it's a fail for the uh, um, So. But going back to your first point, um, I think also that uh, when it comes to story, how we um, read story and think and spread these new innovations, humanity is a species that we live in lives in storytelling. And if we can't change the story, then it will accelerate the rate of change. So then the human species becomes more credible. And that's actually why we and I wrote this book, because if we don't have a purpose for 
consistent and it's even complicated. So, the uh, both the both speak to the heart and to the brain, then we are much less likely to create this feature. I don't think we can create a feature if we're unable to imagine it. Or still. I think that when we think the way we look at things, things we look at things, and we need to go about reframing, and that's particularly what we're doing with this book, is reframing our future. There are so many systems in pretty breaking that we're not recognizing. It, 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 it may be a different way to like that back to it. So we need to allow people experiencing climate change right behind their back and not to be stopped. The only thing that's happening is that consumers uh, share in one another. People are pulling together to share and are more attracted to that. I mean, I started to see the decline in the hate campaign. People hate that. They don't like living with that bitterness in them. And they, so they're pulling together. But I think the storytelling, how we reframe things and how we tell stories that can best deal with that thing. Is kind of a dramatic change, a very quick change. I don't think we have any idea how that's going to happen. And there are little things that I see that are now some of the consequences of some of the worst disasters to do with some of this book. Heart surviving turnout and care. So that's why I think the book would look, but I honestly have no idea how it really going to come down. I think if I were able to watch it from the next world, I would start laughing and say, that's how. <laughs> I love it. So what would you think about it? Would you go for two minutes or eight or down? Just five or six If you're standing next to me, you see what you're doing two minutes or eight. Would the three of you together stand out this way? Who do you think, huh? So, I think it's important that we 
say, well, you know, I do it. It's just because I don't have it. Because A, I want to become an insurance editor. And then I don't bother. Uh, a, I want to become, I mean, you can the lowest thing, but it doesn't really change the key social dynamics of people trusting each other, not trusting each other, or the relevant public spending to a national income. It doesn't really change um, the forest system, the water system. So there are some heavy things that go on um, irrespectively. And these are taken care of in the model and it provides a form. Then I'd like to come to that. And I think AI is incredibly fascinating. Um, and we will clearly have a choice as we walk into the, the future about what it can and what it cannot be. Um, so first I'd like to say that the, the way that we manage it in storytelling, AI artificial intelligence today is incredibly limited. For instance, petroleum companies use AI in order to better uh, geological analysis of the reservoir so they can drill more effectively. So you know we have this incredible scientific breakthrough and we used it to make a geologist, a petroleum geologist engineer a little bit better. That is an extractive training around a very social technology. You can have the same issue uh, in terms of how they use AI in social media. We use it to um, create thought bubbles, so I connect people who think the same way with other people, and then I put uh, advertisements in there in order to extract economic value from creating homogenous bubbles of thought. So it's a very extractive and homogeneous, homogenizing way of using AI. However, if you use AI differently, you can restore the AI to become a helper, a friend, something that's not just a farm or capacity to do macro uh, scoping. So let me give you two examples. I think AI can really help us. First is getting around in cities. Why not have an AI that knows where people want to be at what time and then coordinate cars and buses and public networks and tanks and electric scooters and all the different cars we have? So that it's a huge, huge problem to solve. How does everybody get there without any second? AI is perfect for making those kind of coordination. Then you have to have a coordination set, not an abstraction set, right? You can reimagine what AI can do. Another example is circular economy. Anybody heard of circular economy here? Yeah, I think they heard of it. That's a classic question. Yeah. Now, I have a look at the construction industry in Europe. And the issue there is there are huge values in existing buildings in terms of existing. Building materials. However, when you pull down one building because it has been old or it has been newly developed, they, it's very hard to find a customer at the right time for the right material at the right geographic or time. So, what you can do is to create digital twins of the building in your city. So now you have like a data set or a virtual space where you have all the materials of all the buildings matched in there. And then if you're an architect and you will be diligent the next day, you can ask the AI, what building available is easy to build materials with stone and energy that fit my, my business for this building next year? And suddenly the AI can provide an answer that you were unable to do because you have not have the capacity to map uh, the green with the potential fresh materials that would be used. So these are two examples of how I think AI can help create a grand loop. But we have to reimagine the framework, how we want to use AI, what is an AI, how can it become a creativity helper, a generator of opportunity, rather than something that's just maximized and abstract. So it is that framework around the AI that is important, not the AI. That is my little comment on that. And then together. The oh, Private in these projects, yeah. and the effects that this will have on society and what the reaction to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. society reaction and, 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 and uh, the problem of an urgent problem given that some significant portions of the planet will be pretty uninhabitable over time. 
horrific or terrible <laughs> uh, topic you bring up in terms of how would climate drive uh, human migration. And um, I was looking for a slide here. Yeah, so I think two days later, scenario, we did have normal surface average 42 degrees in 2015. And we know this is for the uh, total unrest, not about being a more moderate. So then, um, how do we deal with that? And uh, what are the ramifications? Uh, and the only honest answer is we don't know. Because we have a lot of stuff in this, uh, inspired actually by the book a lot of you have heard of uh, from the Ministry of the Future, uh, with the five million Indians who die in a heat wave, etc. So, a few comments. Uh, first, if you look at the population there, it's a billion of people. And even if, let's say, seven to ten million Indians die in a heat wave, this is not visible in the thickness of that line. So, despite this creating huge political tsunami, the, it doesn't really destroy humanity. Yeah. So, what we do is get this migration plan. And the problem with using a model to predict that is that it hasn't happened yet. So, we look at all the related studies. How much would one tenth of a degree warming result in how many million degree migrants would we get? And the current data has no bearing on this because it's not really the temperature that drives it, it is the stability of the society. It's going to sustain that society. It is a combination of the sort of risk to climate change. It has to do with the public spending for persons in that country, whether they're able to house their. Uh, victims of climate change in a way that is in uh, is dignified that. And uh, that is why we ended up making a, uh, I call this after a while, we call it a catastrophe generation. So in a modern system, when you get it wrong, you will find a capacity like a factor from 0 0.1 to 10, the amount of migration is really disturbing. Uh, and if you want to crack uh, the system, you can play with that. You have a catastrophe generator, but the current state of knowledge is insufficient in order to put it into uh, its uh, uh, valid manner. So that is why we ended up making it uh, into a game. And I run it now three times with, uh, first of all, I use the model twice in history. Uh, in, in September, I had uh, 120 teachers in all over the world invited to know the prizes in Stockholm. We ran this whole game, and then last week I did it at the Manchester Community School in the Bishop School. And hopefully by January you can play the game too. So maybe and we think that we arrange there so you can come back and then you can pass, uh, do running different seasons of the world, and you can turn the capacity generated from zero point one up to ten, and then we see what happens. <laughs> you have to stop me today. I have to stop. Yeah. Well, I just want to make a quick statement. I mean, the fact that we now have cracked the code for nuclear fusion versus nuclear fission, and that the future of care is providing limited energy for the Earth, which is one of the categories that we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, that has happened so recently. Very thoughts about how that nuclear fusion model is constantly. That's my question. Very strong opinion to that, but it's not in a positive way. I would say this thing about nuclear fusion now being had a very clear vision of energy out and with it is a huge American money maker. <laughs> It's the casual, not the easy one to ever resolve the climate crisis because the commercial available efficiency is 30, 30 years down the line. But in 30 years, we have even solved the climate crisis from now. So maybe it's not an effect for the second half of the century when we need to maintain and replace the solar panels after they have been used for 40 years, which is the average lifetime of the solar panels. So um, what we do is to exploit um, the 
manager of installing uh, more and more solar panels. We tripled that in about three hundred billion dollars per year to more than a trillion dollars per year. Uh, what is extraordinary doing with that? We definitely make that much difference. But that's the kind of amount of money that we need to be investing. I'm happy we don't have to wait thirty years to do that. We can do that tomorrow. And that is why we focus on the financial opportunities and the possibility of this. And I can show you to really analyze how this will look. And the good news is that it's more profitable than to continue with the fossil fuel system. Uh, so now we're getting into the deep end. Sorry, if that's uh, so here. Um, so this is electricity production, the green one in uh, the plant B, and it's driven by the investment in renewable energy electricity production. So this is uh, solar and wind, and it goes straight up there. And by 2060, renewable is 95% of the energy system. But we see that today, fossil continues to dominate into the 2050. And this will take a lot of upfront and cost uh, investment, but it is paid down in the matter of five to seven years. So we get increased investment yield, but the cost of the solar system actually goes down. And that is the, 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 the fantastic good news we have. And that is why PC is not necessary. I have to stop it. It's very fine. It's quite stuff, but it has nothing to do with solar system. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with nothing to do with it. Um, I think um, yeah, I think the 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 you know, the right that is 8 to, 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 to 16 and when it comes to this climate condition and the use of uh, material resources. Now, how can we turn that into an opportunity? And some of the key things is that, um, particularly in Ordinal with the Ukrainian law, we see how fossil fuels are not an asset but a liability. Uh, it creates room stability, it creates food security, and it creates uh, occasions and opportunities for authoritarian dictators. So, the big opportunity is to use uh, what the military uh, can see that if you're dependent on petroleum delivery into war zones, that becomes a primary target for smart precision uh, rockets, etc. So, we see a, a huge Turn, particularly in the US Navy and the, the other militaries, become energy fossil independent. They want to get out of fossil energy in their operating units. So we can have a invest in the Navy, invest in heavy, in uh, how to make uh, renewable energy accessible to uh, decentralized units so they are not exposed to the risk of fossil fuels in particular. The Navy, rather than being a major force for ground uh, going forward, not so much um, part of the military, which can hold it to the new technology that helps for them and society become more uh, renewable. Also, in terms of reminding everybody how we met that time, started out the military technology, and now it's available for everybody with the GPS and the real time system. So, maybe I, I'm not saying I'm just trying to put this in another kind of frame of this that it's not longer just a, a, a huge barrier. It could become a contributor to accelerate, particularly this issue of fossil fuel being a security issue. Uh, Europe will never go back to European gas, so it's Russian gas. Uh, so, uh, even in Europe now, they're starting to speak about solar and wind as freedom energy. Freedom energy. It gives you security, it gives you fuel freedom because you become independent of those who are the children. So it's an interesting twist um, that fossil rather than becoming the national energy security has flipped over to becoming national insecurity. And you have to get out of it. Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. 
Very important question. So it's like um, it's one of the it's one of the big stuff we also get in this country already. So we should start up a particular suggestive um, context to this that we are encouraging a particular kind of growth uh, in the world's low income countries. Because that was also the driver, and this time we're saying we for all consumption, but we have that. So in our whiteness, we may want to tell the brown people that they shouldn't grow the way we are. Um, which is a type of 
in de tekst dat deze instant is dat de troon van de heren staat, dat deze dan ook laat ik doen. En dat is van spreken met een van de mannen. Zij had het zo, zij had het zo over dat de tekst. Maar, of course, je kan het bouwen. Ik, die andere is dat nou weer aan. En dit is de stand die we hebben, maar dit is van het licht en dit is het licht van het licht. Dat is van mij, van mij staat het te hebben, dit is dat het licht, maar ook is dat het licht staat, maar dit is een linie van het licht, maar ook dat het stem is van het licht. En je hebt het gebruikt. I made this into a systems diagram, which is the first one I showed you in terms of um, uh, this. So the whole point is that if the only is the positive one, and we can have low income countries grow with petroleum and waste their material flow and waste the food system that destroys other aspects and create pollution with plastic. You then, then, then it's a lot of this thing about. What we're thinking about is saving poverty in a way that is consistent with a renewable energy system and a food system that provides healthy nourishment within sanitary boundaries and supports jobs for the people. So it is interconnected, and that is the main answer to your very sharp and intelligent question. So thank you for raising that. Uh, it is uh, crucial to us to that we can deal with these five areas separately. And hopefully, what I've tried to convey today is that it's a systems approach, and only when we run a low income country in the new energy with a food system that grows nourishing food in a way that generates local jobs. In a way that raises the income of the food, then you have to translate this new type of direction for the system. And, and that is the main answer. And we've calculated it so it actually does work. It can grow the economic value when taking down energy of CO2 and making secure amounts of nourishing food on less areas of land, which destroys less food. And again, if we didn't do the numbers, then we could may have been stronger at the fairy tale. But you can go away and have a look at the numbers, and they actually are within the realm of the feasible. This is a science based study. Top down has also a model. And to be honest, we're not fully finished with this, but one of the key to the AR is that they have a high base of what we call time. If you have one of these supercomputers, you have analysis of um, every where every square mile like you could do of all the soil in the world, and then in a depth of one and a half meter. So it calculates the how the pressure of the moon in the soil, in the soil, and how the nutrient flow is there, and then we add that up to country level, we add it up to regional level. And this is the part that is completely finished. So we have a top down approach to the food system here, and then we're working hard on completing a formula that verifies or at least shows us what part, the level of convergence between the system dynamics approach and this bio based dual spectral high resolution type of model. So, again, I hope this is a clear answer that this is science based, or it is possible. And we're still working on finalizing the, the science details. So stay tuned. There's a PhD on this working on this right now, something which is set up in Berlin. All right, I have a few short breaks for you. The first one is that they come up in your circle code. Say the last of the box. I think it's going to be Yeah, last of the box. So can we have a couple of mini things on the screen with you? Can we upgrade your operating system so that planet? which is hopefully what we're looking for. And uh, the thing I want to leave you with is that I hope that this means we can all be as friends. I hope this is a new song for you at the club. So I hope that we've got something new and to think about, to chew on, to work with, talk about, to be in discussion with. And I'd love to give a huge round of applause to Tara. So thank you all for joining us.
I have a feeling that some of you will want to ask a lot more questions, so I still will have a little more time after this, so it's more informal discussion. And the last thing to mention is that I'm here with the special license presentation, so if you want to support the Midland Institute having lots more planning lectures, this is the first kicking off the second round of planning lectures that will go on in 2023. So thank you, Sarah, for being our first planning lecture, and thank you all so much for coming tonight. So feel free to stay around and have some informal conversation, or feel free to enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you.